Speaking of Collingwood, yeah, the Magpies have also made it through and their co-captain, one of my favourite AFLW players, Steph Kiochi, has stopped her getting ready for work routine to join us this morning. Hi, Steph. Hello, thank you for having me. And I didn't realise Zoe didn't have a team, so that changes things now. I'm going to have to try and convince her to go Collingwood. And I know all about going for the rival team, so we can chat, we can definitely chat. Good luck with that, Steph. Um, Thank you. <laughs> now, we're still friends after the result on Sunday? Yeah, we sure are. We go way, we go way back further than just the game of footy, don't we, Ange? Um, but, yeah, it was a good contest. Adelaide, obviously, as you mentioned, finished on top of the ladder now and have won two of the last four, well, two of the last three, really. We didn't have a result last year. So they're still minor pre um, reigning premiers, really, aren't they? They are. They absolutely are. Yeah. Now, this year's a bit different. There's a top six. The Magpies have finished third. You just missed out on second place uh, by percentage. Um, this means you've got a qualifying final against North Melbourne coming up. But how would you assess the season that your team has had? Yeah, well, firstly, obviously, we've had um, a ladder that includes everybody rather than the two conferences. So it's nice that we've got a top six. But for us, I suppose, looking back to to year one and year two, we, we underperformed. I think it's well documented. Um, I think we won a handful of games in those two seasons. And in year three, we only won the one game. So to see where we are today is really pleasing, having been there from the start. Um, we've had a pretty consistent season. We won six games on the trot um, and then dropped a game to, to Brisbane who were really, really competitive. Um, and then Obviously now we, we sit third and we take on North Melbourne in a qualifying final, which is very similar to last year um, where we face them um, in that same round. So it's going to be very interesting. Steph, Ange mentioned that we've stopped you from going to work this morning. <laughs> you might be a few minutes late because of us. Uh, I'm curious how you're balancing working and training and the demands of playing. You know, Ange alluded in the interview to my Essendon uh, loyalties and, and it so happens that my dad played for the Bombers and when he first started playing in the late 60s and 70s, he was also working as a full-time teacher and playing for the Bombers mm. and getting paid something like 30 bucks a game. So it was a very different time. H how do you work through that? Because I know that's been something that you've had to balance over the last couple of years. How's that going? Yeah, look, I think, you know, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have said, oh, I just feel really lucky to be playing footy and absolutely love it and things like that. But um, I suppose the novelty shifted in a sense where now I'm going, geez, it really, really is hard and um, balancing that sort of full-time work and then heading into training. Like a typical morning would be getting up around this time um, and then heading into work and not getting home till 4, 4.30, training starts at 6 and then you're not home till 9.30, 10 p.m. So it is quite taxing and then if you add the travel factor, although obviously Collingwood haven't travelled too often this season, but um, there are other teams that have done a tonne of travel and are balancing their study, part-time and full-time work. So it is challenging, but at the end of the day, we love what we do and it, it's just the way, way that it is for now and hopefully we're paving the way for a full-time competition where girls can actually strive to become an AFRW player on a full-time wage and that could be their income. So we know the part and role we're playing, I suppose, at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I guess it's just a really fine balancing act. You probably caught me on a very tired morning um, given that we have just returned from Adelaide. Um, but, yeah, I won't be complaining because we do love what we do and we've got finals to play now. Collingwood men's team mm. doesn't travel much too. <laughs> yeah, good stab, Dan. Um, yeah, apparently not. Apparently not. Apparently we're very well looked after. That's what I'm hearing. I've never got so much abuse on Twitter, I think, about the fact that we haven't travelled and I just sort of gone, just sat there and took it in and went, wow, this is what it's like to be a Collingwood player, isn't it? Even if you're in the middle of a pandemic and you've got no control over it. <laughs> Part of the territory. Uh, this season there were nine regular season games. Um, how many would you like to see? In an ideal world, we would play everybody once, wouldn't we? Um, so you'd have 13 games um, with the one full ladder. Um, I think the shift to have the one full ladder this season has been really pleasing and a positive step forward for our competition. Um, but, yeah, I'd love to have a crack at every team. Um, I think that's probably obviously the fairest way to do it, but I understand that there are restraints and 
Um, at the moment, it is the nine games and the three weeks of finals. And I think next year is quite similar as well. How do you see it evolving, Steph? As in, you know, when do you see other teams coming in? When do you see that expansion starting to happen? Yeah, I think our current CBA um, concludes at the end of 2022 and I think we're set with the amount of teams until then. Um, it'd be nice to see, you know, your Essendon and Hawthorne, uh, Port Adelaide and Sydney, you know, become a part of the competition in the near future. I think it, it all starts at grassroots level. We've got lots and lots of girls playing the game at the moment and, you know, the numbers seem to increase every year. I don't know what COVID or how COVID has affected that. Obviously, there was no state league here in Victoria last year, but, um, you know, you've got that clear pathway now from junior NAB kick. Um, there's a youth girls competition and then the NAB league into the AFLW. So if we continue to invest in the grassroots, we get girls playing our wonderful sport, um, develop them from a really young age and prepare their bodies for, you know, the top level, then I can't see why we can't have um, you know, those four extra teams or the four teams coming into the competition in the near future. I think it was always touted as being 2030 um, is when they wanted a full-time competition. I don't know if that's through the PA or, or the AFL, but that was sort of the, the, the aim. Um, and, yeah, we're working towards that. As you said, Steph, you've been there from the beginning. I want to take you back to the inaugural AFLW draft. And we met around about that time because uh, I was making a documentary and featuring you as one of our um, players. Let's just take a look at how it all unfolded because it didn't really go according to plan for you on that day. There was so much tension and we were riding it all with you, just desperately <laughs> wanting your name to be called out. Just just talk us through that day and how important it was for you. Yeah, it's super important. I think coming off the back of representing the Western Bulldogs um, in the exhibition series, that's what you're alluding to. I um, obviously captained them and, and played with them for two or three years. And if, for people that don't know, obviously the exhibition series was a, a, a game between Melbourne and, and the Bulldogs um, to showcase women's football and there was a mini draft years before that. So I'd been involved with the Bulldogs and wasn't taken with their priority pick, which they had an opportunity to, to sign someone that was involved with their club, um, which was disappointing at the time, but I think everything happens for a reason. And, yeah, we had to sit at the draft in the end and patiently wait for the name to be called out. And I think it was Collingwood's pick then it was Bulldogs and then Carlton. So there was just so many emotions, you know. Collingwood, yay, great. The, the arch rivals of Carlton who I grew up barracking for, Bulldogs who, you know, didn't take me their priority pick but I still had a connection to. And then Carlton, my beloved Blue Boys, you know. It was, I should say, Blue blue Boys and girls now, um, <laughs> although we don't like the girls. Um, you know, so it was just a weird, 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 um, weird night or mm. weird day. Mm. Let's jump forward now to the AFLW Grand Final this year. If Collingwood wins the right to host the Grand Final, where should it be played? That's a very good question. I actually got asked this by a journalist in Adelaide over the weekend, um, not, not referencing us making the Grand Final, just in general. And she mentioned the MCG and I was like, absolutely. Wouldn't that be unreal? Um, look, if we win... If we make it to the grand final, you know, I think I feel obliged to say we'd want to play at our spiritual home at Big Park. Um, it is really special to us, obviously, the history involved. You know, you don't need me to go through all that, but there is something very special about the place. And, um, you know, if the walls could talk, I tell you what, I reckon there'd be many, many stories. Um, but, yeah, we love playing there and, you know, we've made it our fortress. We... You know, we haven't dropped a game there this season and we're really trying to make it our own. Although we don't train there, um, when we do play there, it is really special and we feel as though it lifts us. So um, I, I think I'll have to say Vic Park. <laughs> I have to Steph, disagree. How do, you, how do you manage the pressure? <laughs> <laughs> Vic Park, that, that could be an interesting, uh, quite noisy game if it went ahead at Vic Park, I think. I was just going to ask, Steph, how you, how you manage the pressure. You know, you talked about how it felt on draft day and I wonder if that ever goes away you know you you get drafted and then you have to perform and then you become the co-captain and then you're trying to make the grand final so you've got that that pressure there all the time you know 
I think it actually speaks to women in a range of industries and also girls who are coming through mm-hmm. trying to achieve their dreams and who are ambitious, who will stumble on the way, find things difficult as they try to find a path. But, you know, how do you navigate that daily pressure, that expectation, both of others, because you've got fans on you and the coach, but mm. also yourself? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, you, you look at our form in the first few years as, as a sole captain at the club at the time, you know, we weren't performing, we weren't winning, I wasn't playing my best football. And yeah, the, the pressure does, you know, mount on you. And you do feel sort of responsible for that. But I soon learned that, you know, even as a leader, it's really important to lean on other people. Um, I'm certainly not someone that thinks that I have to do it all by myself. And the one, yeah, probably the main thing I've learned being in a leadership position is that it's okay to have, I would say, weaknesses, but areas to improve. And um, I quickly learned that you need to rely on other people and you need to voice that. Um, and I think that's what makes a leadership group um, and a team really, really solid is if you can do that. So um, to be fair, the last two seasons, because we've been playing better football and um, we've seen a shift in the way that we want to play, the, the pressure sort of eased a little bit. Um, but now in saying that, the expectation is that we do, you know, go really deep into finals. So we're just going to make sure that we focus on the process and, if we play the way that we want to play, then, you know, the reward, the win will take care of itself. Um, I truly do believe that. But, again, it is just about leaning on other people and making sure you're all on the same page, um, blocking out the external noise, um, making sure that you're just focusing on what, what's going on inside the four walls. I know that's very cliche, but it is true. We can't be worrying about what's being said on the outside. Um, easier said than done, but um, just ensuring that we know what we're doing um, and we're staying on track for that. And has sharing the captaincy helped with all of that for you? Yeah, it really has. I absolutely love co-captaining with Bree Davey. You know, fantastic person um, above anything else. Um, we get along like a house on fire um, and obviously one of the competition's best players and a great leader. So um, I- I've absolutely loved it. And I think the club, the way the club approached it was to ensure that, you know, I'm not burning out. Um, it's it's Breeze's time as well and um, I think we work really well together and it's just really nice to share that load and we do lead in very different ways but then we're always on the same page and we see things really similarly. So um, it's been a real blessing for me, um, I'd say, this, this season, especially working full-time. Last year I took term one off um, to focus on football and committed myself to football which really helped my footy, my development, I think the team as well. Um, whereas this year I'm obviously heading off to work after this. So um, wasn't granted that, that leave and it's nice to have someone to share the load with, that's for sure. But are you still having fun? I am. I am having fun. Um, it's a lot more fun when you're winning, um, that's for sure. I'd be lying if I said that didn't play a factor. But, no, I think from where we've come from, being there in, in the inaugural season to where we are now, where we're playing some really good football, we've got a great young list um, of girls, really good people. I think that's what drives me and, um, you know, we want success and we're on the right path towards it. So we just need to keep grinding and um, enjoying ourselves on the way. Um, But, yeah, it's really important to to remember that it is about having fun as much as it is winning. Um, But I think they go hand in hand. Well, Steph, as we wrap up, Mm. who's the team to beat? Well, obviously us. Uh, it's going to be us. But um, having played, you know, both the top two teams, Adelaide and Brisbane, um, very, very, very good outfits. Um, I think Adelaide's probably in the box seat for me. Um, they were just really fast, really fit um, and really disciplined in the way they wanted to play and um, they were able to shut down our game. So, yeah, I think Adelaide is probably the team to beat at the moment. For the record, if you host the final, it should be at the MCG. If it's Adelaide, it should be Adelaide Oval. If it's Brisbane, it should be the Gabba. That's where I stand on this issue. (laughs) I think we should really push. We should push and push to be on the biggest stage possible for women in sport. That's... um, That's where I stand on the issue. Steph, thanks for joining us. I know you've got to get to work. It's been great to chat to you. All the best over the next three weeks and say hi to your mum and dad from me. I will do. I'm sure Dad will be definitely listening to this. No worries at all.